Okay, well, welcome to this tech talk on privacy. Before Peter starts talking here, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce you to Peter. Peter uh, is, it's, it's very hard to give Peter an introduction because he's done so many great things in his life. Uh, I know him as a friend. I met him at Google.org, uh, where we had a chance to work together. Um, and we, had, we were working on uh, a project called Instead to do some early detection of uh, all sorts of bad things, including diseases, and uh, trying to help uh, with a collaboration with Google.org uh, to go prevent those things. Um, but Peter is particularly positioned well to talk about privacy because of his background, not just at Instead and Google.org, but because of his previous life. Um, he has quite a depth of experience with the pharmaceutical industry and the challenges that the pharmaceutical industry went through uh, in communicating to its customers uh, and, and what happened when they got that wrong and then eventually what happened when they got that right. And so I asked Peter to come in and talk with us about the learnings from the pharmaceutical industry and so that we can just absorb those and maybe apply those across our portfolio of products. So with that, let me just turn it over to Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Vic. Well, it's a pleasure being here, and uh, I know I'm being recorded, and so that uh, in addition to the people in this room, hopefully other people will have the chance to look at this talk uh, at their leisure. <clears throat> The issue here is to try to describe to you first uh, a very difficult experience that we had within the pharmaceutical industry, and then to try to generalize from that experience to what I see as the Google challenge. And, and let me begin by also thanking Matt Waddell for helping sensitize me to the fact that you people are already doing a lot of things, some of which I may not be aware of. So uh, as I speak, uh, if I make suggestions which are things that you implemented two or three weeks ago but we just haven't seen yet, don't hesitate to let me know. Um, I don't mind being corrected and I don't mind being proven wrong. <coughs> Let's see, okay. <coughs> this all occurred in the 1980s at a company called Alza, which was the world's first drug delivery company and uh, is the company that used to be your neighbor uh, right here on uh, Shoreline, Air, Shoreline Park area. At the time, we were based in Palo Alto, and <clears throat> what we were trying to do was totally change the way that drugs were delivered into the human body. Instead of having drugs given in a pill two or three times a day, what we wanted to do was to create delivery systems that delivered that drug at a constant rate over a long period of time. And the first two products that we developed were proof of concept products. The OcuCert, which was a device which was put in the eye and which delivered pilocarpine for a week. And the second one was the Progestacert, which was an intrauterine contraceptive system which used the female hormone progesterone and achieved a year's worth of contraception for the same amount, using the same amount of drug as you would take in one oral contraceptive pill. And it did that by delivering it to the target organ and doing it in very minute quantities at a constant rate. Um, many of you have perhaps been exposed to transdermal patches. Those all came from ALSA. That was all technology that we developed. And we basically were the beginning of a very large industry. And later on, we were acquired for a lot of money by J&J &J and now have disappeared from, from the scene. But the work that we did remains today and had a profound impact on the pharmaceutical industry. However, in the early days, we were still trying to prove what we were doing. And actually, ALSA went for 13 years before it was profitable. So uh, this was an incredibly difficult time, both for fundraising and also to convince the people in the pharmaceutical industry that this approach made sense. And we had a lot riding on these two proof of concept products, the OcuCert and the Progestacert. Well, after we had developed the progesterone and taken it through all of its testing and gotten FDA approval, suddenly one of the existing products in the marketplace, which was called the Dalclon Shield, ran into incredible difficulties because it was A, poorly designed, B, poorly marketed, and C, uh, the corporation which was marketing it uh, behaved in a, an extremely inappropriate manner. And this is documented in, in great detail for those of you who would like to read a horror story in a book called At Any Cost, Corporate Greed, Women in the Dalcon Shield by Morton Mintz. And Morton Mintz was one of the premier writers for the Washington Post and somebody who was a constant and very harsh critic of the pharmaceutical industry. 
And A.H. Robbins was a company which was a multi-generational company owned by, founded by the Robbins family. Uh, and it was essentially destroyed by the way in which they managed this product. Uh, it went bankrupt. Uh, tens of thousands of women were severely impacted by this. Uh, hundreds of women were killed by this product. Uh, and lo and behold, here we had another IUD. Well, not only did we have another IUD, but the other companies that were in the marketplace, as soon as the Dalcon Shield disappeared, they said, hey, this is a marketplace we don't want to be in. It's just too risky. And so suddenly, we were not only an IUD, but we were the only IUD that was left. And <clears throat> this was, in our opinion, a recipe for disaster. The problem was, we couldn't afford to take one of our proof of one of our two proof of concept products off the marketplace because we had to demonstrate to uh, our investors, the companies we were trying to adopt our technology, that this concept of controlled drug delivery really worked. <clears throat> so what did we do then? Suddenly we were alone in a very high risk, very low profit margin market niche. We were not, no matter what happened with sales, we weren't going to make very much money off of this thing. And the risk of a single lawsuit would dramatically overwhelm the profit from even tens of thousands of successful products. So the question that we had as a management team was how do we protect the company, how do we protect the product, and how do we protect the consumers? The first thing we did was consult widely. And I've learned a long time ago that I don't learn very much from the people who agree with me. If I want to get insight into a problem, I have to search out my critics. And I have to sit down with the people who I don't necessarily want to talk to and who have not necessarily said nice things about me or my industry or my product. And so we went to people like Sid Wolf, uh, who runs the, uh, a, a health consumer group. Um, uh, works for, with Ralph Nader. Uh, we went to Morton Mintz, uh, who wrote the book uh, on the A.H. Robbins situation. That was a very interesting interaction because here is an active journalist, and I went to him and I said, we're the last IUD in the marketplace, what should we do? And he said, I don't give advice. He said, but I will tell you the questions that I'm going to ask you once you've made your decision. And it was incredible because I just sat there and wrote down like for about 20 minutes, he just basically said, this is the interview that you're going to have when you've made your decision. And it was an incredible way to learn about the problem from the perspective of someone else. And he basically said, and he said, you know, I've never had this kind of conversation with someone in the pharmaceutical industry before, and I don't think I ever will again. We realized that we came to the realization that the way that we could deal with this was to prevent harm to the women. And if we prevented harm to the women, then we could prevent harm to the product and to the company. Most people in the pharmaceutical industry look at malpractice as sort of a cost of doing business. And how much do they have to set aside for malpractice suits, et cetera, et cetera. And until we started dealing with this issue, no one said, wait a minute, this is something we can do proactively. One of the real problems in the pharmaceutical industry is you take it through testing with a very well-defined group of people. They're all very much the same age, shape, form. And the minute it's approved, you have all sorts of other people using it. And that's in classes of people who've never been tested before. And the marketing people have a very different objective than the medical people. Once you put it in the hands of marketing, you're in deep trouble because these people's job is to sell. And we tried to, and we gradually realized that one bad sell, sale was wiping out the value of tens of thousands of good sales. The other thing we had to be willing to do was to depart from the norm of the industry. The norm of the industry was to do the absolute minimum that was required by the FDA. A company would go to the FDA and say, we have this product, we'd like to have it approved, and they wanted to negotiate what was called the cleanest labeling in the world. No side effects, no problems. Well, the minute you put a drug on the marketplace, you start getting side effects and problems. And that patient labeling gets longer and longer and longer. <clears throat> the industry was always resisting having the label get 
longer because they saw that as a negative from a marketing standpoint and didn't realize that the better the labeling was, in fact, the better the situation was for the company. One of the things that evolved out of this was changing our priorities. I talked about how do we protect the company, the product, and the consumers, and we realized we had it wrong. It was how do we protect the consumers, and that will protect the product, and that will protect the company. And changing that perspective was very crucial to the decisions we then made. We came up with what's called informed choice labeling. We began down the road of looking at the issue of informed consent, which came out of the Nuremberg trials and a variety of other things. It was a legal concept that was imposed upon the medical community. But it was a legal concept which we didn't think really solved the problem because consent was something which was perceived by consumers as something which was done under duress. And we moved to the concept of informed choice. We ended up producing a document, a patient package insert. The FDA required a three-page insert for IUDs. Ours was 12 pages long. It was full disclosure, and it stressed the risk. It began on the front page saying, you're about to make a decision which could be potentially fatal. You can imagine what the marketing people thought about that. <clears throat> it ended on the last page by saying, you have now know everything that we know about this product, and it's now up to you to make a decision. Do you want to use the product or not? And that was an explicit choice on the last page. I have read this information, and I want to use this product, or I've read this information, and I've decided not to use this product. And that then was a transaction not between us and the woman, but between the woman and her physician. And we had one very prominent physician who said, I'm not going to do this. It takes too much of my time. And I said, thank you very much. We will never sell you another product. And he said, I'll sue you. And I said, tell me when and where, because I want the cameras there. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> the important thing is that we gave the patient every piece of information we had about the product, and we constantly updated it. And we gave them the option to use or not use the product based on their risk preference. And my risk preference and your risk preference are almost always different. Almost always different. And so we have to really respect the individual's preferences. The progesticert remained on the market. Women were given both a contraceptive option, which they could or could not use. They were protected with better information. The labeling was praised by the critics. Sid Wolf stood up and said that he thought this was the best labeling he'd ever seen. Morton Mintz wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post about what we had done. The pharmaceutical industry was stunned to hear either Wolf or Mintz talk positively about anything that's ever happened in the pharmaceutical industry. I received a wonderful copy of Morton Mintz's book signed by Morton Mintz thanking us for what we had done. The FDA challenged the labeling, said you can't do that. You don't have our permission. And we said, we don't need your permission. The law says that we can increase warnings anytime we want to. And one year later, they came back and said, your new labeling is approved except on page six where you've described the device as small, you have to give its metric dimensions. <laughs> there was no litigation from that point forward in an otherwise litigation-filled niche. And that was primarily because the women who should not use this product because they, have, they were contraindicated. They had multiple sexual partners. They had a history of pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, they had compromised immune systems. We said to those women, don't use this product. And so the way we got, got rid of the malpractice problem was getting rid of the harm. We got rid of the harm by making sure that the wrong women did not use this product. And most importantly, that ALZA then proceeded to establish a new standard with scores of other innovative products. Our two proof of concept products remained in the marketplace. They proved what controlled drug delivery could do. And out of that, then hundreds of other products came in different forms and shapes. Your customers trust Google with lots of their personal information identity, location, intellectual interests, medical information, and much more. 
as Vic has commented earlier, you know, I'm not sure I want anybody uh, to look through my search history. Uh, I set up my Firefox, though, when I close it, it clears the history. Uh, a little bit paranoid. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that that history is out there someplace else, and I don't have the option of clearing it. <laughs> what are the implications of informed choice for Google? You've created an incredibly valuable brand. And I know that all of you that are part of this organization are incredibly proud to be part of this organization. But you also know and appreciate the fact that there are lots of people out there who just think the world of you. This is an organization that is held in very high respect. People believe that you will do no evil. However, that brand and that trust are very fragile. And I believe it's therefore important for you to work much, much harder to trust your customers. Now, what do I mean by that? Your current practice, and again, I'm very thankful for Matt for saying, hey, Peter, go look at what we're doing before you get critical about it. You inform your customers about how you use and protect our information. Yet, I have talked to hundreds of Google customers since, I started, since Vic asked me to prepare this presentation. And virtually none of them are at all familiar with what is in your privacy policy. It's there, and it covers a certain number of things, but people don't look at it. It's not something which people engage with. One of the things we found when we did the Progestive Cert Patient Package Labeling, on those 12 pages, it's very interactive. There are about 15 or 20 questions that have to be answered yes or no. There are boxes that have to be checked. There are places that have to be initialed. We had to engage the women to make sure that they, in fact, read the information, and we tested that. And we knew that unless there was a high degree of interactivity, people would simply go to the last page and just sign a name and it wouldn't mean anything. And while that may have satisfied the lawyers, it wouldn't have accomplished what we wanted to accomplish, which was to make sure that women who shouldn't use the product didn't use the product. Your current policy is, as I read it, one size fits all, all or nothing, take or leave it, assume consent policy. There's a line in there that says, hey, if you don't want us to give this information, then you know, we may not be able to do very much for you. You have fulfilled your responsibility. There is no doubt about that. But you have not maximized your opportunity. You, as the preeminent organization in the world, in this field, have the opportunity to do something which is truly unique. And let's talk a little bit about what you might think about doing. Offer your customers varying degrees of privacy and protection in return for varying degrees of quality of searching and services. The more information I'm willing to share with you and to leave with you, the better job you can do of helping me make my next decision. If, on the other hand, I as an individual have a different sense of privacy and I don't want to leave you with information, allow me the privilege of saying, okay, You'll use this information during this particular session, but at the end of the session, the information is going to be wiped out. Now, I know that Amazon, for example, has got tons of information about my reading habits. And it's fascinating because a few years ago, uh, we have a home in England and lots of nieces and nephews there, and, I, it, and it's out in the country. And so what I wanted to do was to create a library for the children so they had some place to go and read. And so I spent about three weeks populating this library by going to Amazon US and Amazon UK and other places and buying all these children's books. And for the next six months, all my recommendations were out from Amazon were on children's books. <laughs> and now that's sort of washed out and now they're moving on to other things. Um, Amazon's an organization which I think does a horrible job of uh, protecting my privacy because they've, given, they've taken tons of information from me. Um, one time, many, many years ago, when I first began interacting with the company, they asked my permission. They've never asked my permission since. They continue to collect this information. Uh, if someone went in there with a, a search warrant, uh, the amount of information that would be available would be incredible. Uh, and one of these days, I think someone's going to get into a great deal of trouble at Amazon by virtue of this information which they have uh, with only the very tacit consent of the people from whom they've collected it. Now, once you offer people this variety of choices, 
then let them say, okay, it's really important to me to get good information from you, Google, and in exchange for really high quality information that really meets my needs, I am prepared to authorize you to retain my search histories for six months, 12 months, a year. I'm authorized you to retain my locations for those periods of time. Um, create a dialogue between yourself and each individual customer. What are the payoffs? Well, <clears throat> and before I get to that, let me just say that this morning I said, okay, I'm going to just do a quick scan. What are some of the issues out there? Well, Forbes magazine today has got an article on getting, letting Google take your pulse, talking about your medical records thing. <clears throat> the Center for Digital Democracy comments, they give consumers the appearance of an effective way to keep their health information but it's also a digital goldmine for health marketing. It's one thing to turn your search queries over to Google. This is making them your next of kin. Today again, in PC world, spy on your workers with Google Latitude. Um, there is a, and the moment you get to the EU, the sensitivity, particularly of governments, is dramatically greater than it here, is here in the United States. I predict that there will, in fact, be an explosion of concern when abuses occur. And those abuses will occur either because of a mistake on the part of Google or because you get a court order that requires you to turn over information. Google Latitude may be an absolutely wonderful thing if somebody wants to go into a contested divorce situation. Um, how do you protect against that? Um, and, and do your consumers know that that information will in fact be subject uh, to disclosure in the event that there's a court order? So <clears throat> by moving to this informed choice policy where you offer people the alternative, you're showing greater respect for your individual customers. You're creating a bond with each of those customers because they now have a relationship with you for example, with Amazon, I don't just buy books from Amazon. I bought lots of other things from Amazon because I trust Amazon and because they've already got my credit card and they have my address and it's very convenient to do. I similarly do lots of things with Google. I would do many more things with Google if I was able to fine tune my relationship with Google. It will also allow you to defendably acquire a great deal more information from that subset of people who are willing to do it. And I would suggest that there's a real generational issue here. Those of us who are older tend to be a little bit more sensitive about some of these privacy issues. When you get down to the Facebook and the Twitter generation, uh, there doesn't seem to be any concern about sharing information with other people until maybe you later go get a job and somebody starts looking at your Facebook entries or looking at some of your other records. Uh, so there's a generational issue, and it's also a real challenge for those of you at Google where the average age is relatively low. Uh, and recognize that if you want to reach out to those of us who are more ancient, uh, that we probably have a different privacy profile preference than you do. As you're able to show people that there's a payoff from sharing more information, other customers will in fact trade up and say, okay, if I can get better quality searches, if I can get better services, I'm prepared to give more information. <clears throat> you will be able to, this will also be a great gold mine for you in terms of legitimately tracking what your customers are doing because you'll be doing it with their consent. And it differentiates Google from other providers. It says, you know, we are not we don't treat our customers one size fits all. What we try to do is accommodate the needs of each individual. I continue to be impressed. Not a week goes by that I don't pick up you know, another Google product coming to the marketplace. This organization is incredibly productive. I would just encourage you to recognize that each one of those products needs to be tailored to the customers you're trying to reach. And having a privacy policy for searching 
being the same as for latitude doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it's two entirely different kinds of behavior. And you ought to allow people to say, okay, in latitude, I'll do this. When I use search, I'll do this. When I do my health records, I'll do this. Um, you have enough computers and enough memory to keep track of my preferences. It's not a big issue. And it will dramatically change the, the relationship that I have with you. And I think it will also set a very new and higher hurdle for your competitors. The first company like Google that does this is going to be in the catbird seat. Because first, you'll be saying to your customers that you really care about protecting their privacy, and you're prepared to negotiate with them as to what's, what is an appropriate level of privacy. <clears throat> and second, you're going to set up the mechanics for doing this in a way that only Google can do it. I mean, I, I never cease to be amazed at what you're able to accomplish technically in this company. And if you put your minds to work on creating an informed choice matrix for all of your products for each of your customers, it's really going to be exciting. And also what's going to be exciting is to see how people vote with their feet, which people vote for what levels of privacy with each product. And that will give you some very interesting feedback in terms of how people feel about those products and their comfort level. I also think it's going to protect you from outrage and regulatory actions. And there will be outrage and there will be regulatory actions. You are in a very young industry. And you look at the EU, which is well ahead of the, the United States on information control. You look at what happens in the United States with other kinds of things like pharmaceutical products. <clears throat> Good intentions are followed by abuse, which is followed by regulation. And I've been a regulator, and I've been in industry. And I'll tell you, the best way to deal with regulation is to get out in front of it. The last thing you want to do is to have the government telling you how to do your business. The best way to keep the government from telling you how to do your business is to do no harm. The best way to do no harm or do no evil is to have a better relationship with your, con with your customers. And yeah, I just I had some copies of the Progestus certain in certain case there were questions about it. Basically, that's my pitch, and I would wonder, I would be pleased to take questions and to be challenged. <laughs> yes, sir. I think that it's a great question, and I think that one of the the question was how to deal with the fact that there that one of the nice things about the Google experience is that it's a very simple experience, and it doesn't have a lot of things to check, etc., and it happens very quickly. Um, and I think that that's a great observation, and I think that the way one might deal with that is to come up with with varying degrees of granularity uh, of the process that I've described. And, and somewhat stereotypically, you could have a model for 18-year-olds which said, yeah, I understand all this stuff, and I agree that you can have anything you want, and I really don't care. And so it's one checkbox for the 18-year-old who really doesn't care. Uh, but you put in real bold letters above that, you, know, you are, in fact, giving us a lot of information which is very private, very personal, and you should realize that there are risks associated with this, and if you want to know more about it, go to this page. If you want to just proceed, just check the box. You, know, you can't force people to read stuff that they don't want to read. Um, and then you can say to people who want to engage in more granularity, 
Uh, you can do it by, for example, you could have suites of Google products, uh, ones where basically people are seeking information and say on the information products, this is the way I want to behave. On the transactional suite, this is the way I want to behave. Uh, on other kinds of programs, this is the way I want to behave. Or, or you could say to people, okay, you just tell us ahead of time. The first time you log into Google Alerts, the first time you log into Latitude, uh, you want to have the opportunity to set your own individual preferences. And you could even say the first time you logged in, hey, I'm really too busy to do it now. Remind me to do it later. But give them the opportunity. Give your customer, your consumer, that choice to be more detailed about their, their preferences. You will get good data in terms of you know, how many people go to the fine grain and how many people just do at, at the suite level and how many people do a global permission. And I'm not, and, uh, and again, one of my criticisms is right now it's one size fit all, fits all. I don't want to go in the other direction and say everybody's got to go through 55 questions to use a single product. I think that there are intelligent responses that can cover the whole spectrum. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the question goes to what's the, what's the boundary condition between what's public and what's private. And, you know, I have, I've had some fascinating interactions. My, my much younger daughter-in-law got me onto Facebook. Uh, and so not a whole lot of people my age on Facebook. And <clears throat> it's been a fascinating transaction. And, and I read this one comment from somebody that's saying, you know, well, I posted that on Facebook, but it was personal. You shouldn't be reading it. So there was no recognition on the part of the person who put it on Facebook that what they put on Facebook is, in fact, available to everybody rather than just to their friends. And so I think you and we, your customers, uh, need to find ways that we begin to better differentiate the public and the private space. Um, yes. And, and so <clears throat> it's a big, huge Venn diagram. And it's not just public and private. It is public, total public, private, totally private, and then gradations in between in terms of here's my family, here's my friends at school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is also a dimension which I think would be incredibly powerful. Right now, a lot of these social networking kinds of things don't have good boundary conditions set in them. And they don't have ways of putting in good boundary conditions. And that's the kind of thing that I think could be an incredible, incredible competitive tool for Google, where you say to people, you can set your boundary conditions for your information. Either it's totally public, it's totally private, or it's someplace in between. And you know, I would just love to have all the incredible talent in this organization thinking about the ways to do that, because you would come up with some beautiful solutions to it. And going back to the previous question, <clears throat> people could take a very simple model and say, I want to use the simple model. Or people could say, I want to use a more sophisticated model. You know, my history on this goes back a long, long way. I was in ARPA working on another project, and someone walked into my office and said, would you be a beta tester for this thing? And I was one of the first 14 people on ARPANET. So I, you know, I've, I've lived with the, the internet since its infancy. Um, and, and I am incredibly impressed with the way it's grown and the incredible positive things it does. But I also recognize there's some incredible difficulties associated with doing it right. Yes. Other questions? 
Um, my email address is peterfcarpenter at gmail.com. Uh, don't hesitate if you have other questions um, to just send me an email. I would love to enter into a dialogue. If I could be at all helpful, I'd be pleased to do that. So thank you very much.